Dr. Tyson, welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Th- thanks for having me. I, li- I love what you've done with the place. Do you like it? We did it all for you. We really hope you appreciate it, sir. <laughs> so you've been courting the video game world recently uh, for your new Kickstarter, Space Odyssey. And I'm just curious, what is it like to interact with that world? I know you're at E3. Do you have any broad impressions of just kind of the, the gaming landscape nowadays? Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. I mean, I'm, I, I go way back with games. I mean, in a day when games on the computer was the thing, it was probably surely still the case, but it was what you did when you didn't want to keep working that day. <laughs> I think that holds true to today, Neil. Yeah. <laughs> still, still the case. Um, in the days before first person shooters and things, they were just, um, of course I was a fan of the more space based games, asteroids and space invaders and this sort of thing. And something cool. I recently learned that remember how space invaders, the more of them you attacked and the fewer that were there, the faster they would come down the screen. Yeah. And I learned recently that originally that was a natural feature of the fact that the processing power was not high enough to move a full screen worth of space invaders quickly. And as you took them out one by one, that same processing power now applied to fewer space invaders (laughs) and it can move them faster. So it was sort of a built in fact of the processor. And then as processors got much, much faster, they then had to program in the speed up. That's just a cute little yeah. fact. I've happy learned. accidents that result in beautiful game design. I think a lot of the world and <laughs> universe is probably a conclusion of happy accidents. So it's beautiful that you notice that. Um, but I, I don't claim special insight in modern time. I mean, I've been very busy writing books and bringing the universe down to earth. So um, this exercise in bringing a new game to the marketplace, um, I, I'm learning a lot. And there are people who have the experience in this that I don't. And of course, what I'm bringing is is sort of scientific uh, accuracy and authenticity, something I care about, something I've criticized movies for not having when they intended to have it. Generally, I don't criticize if no one really cared in the first place, then there's no point to criticize it because that was not their intent. They would have a much more fantasy, um, it might be much more fantasy driven rather than uh, expecting to have any factual foundation. Um, One of my favorite edicts is from Mark Twain, who says, first get your facts straight, then distort them at your leisure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so our primary goal for a space odyssey is to, um, initially you'll be visiting exoplanets. The catalog of exoplanets is now rising past 3,000 in, in, in the known universe, which is, in fact, a very close circle around where the solar system is because the galaxy is huge and the universe is even huger. So, but nonetheless, there's thousands of them. And so we want this to be an adventure game, a game where you, you will go explore what is known about the planet. And then where we don't know more than what's there, you then create it. And so you get to create your own planets and build on them and, uh, uh, spawn civilizations, this sort of thing. But the, what we, what we want to do to distinguish it from all the others is, to have a have an almost a manic attention to scientific detail where the science enables it and where it doesn't that's where your imagination can take it uh, and i'll add that for those who've studied the universe you you realize that there's nothing more stupefying than the universe itself and there's a there's an there's a, a biologist philosopher jbs haldane who once commented that the universe is not only stranger than we have imagined it might be stranger than we can imagine (laughs) so this for me offers limitless moving frontier absolutely uh, it's it's interesting to think about you know you venturing into games a little bit it seems like from our perspective a lot of games out there a crazy majority are about empowering the player it seems like the role of science and thinking about space is to uh, belittle the player (laughs) and to make them think (laughs) less significant (laughs) than they could possibly imagine um, uh, you know, I think it, if you want to think of it as belittling, that's if you come at it, uh, if, if you're not, if you don't think deeply about it, yeah, you, you might feel, uh, uh, cut down by it, but yeah. then you realize how powerful the laws of physics are and what is actually going on in the universe is a stunning, uh, um, it's, it's a stunning panoply of 
things you can do once you see what the laws of physics are. Oh, and by the way, you also end up learn learning. And I'm an educator, so learning is an important feature uh, of what's going on here. But I, I don't want to think of it as an educational game because there's, there's educational product out there. Uh, it's still, I want to make sure it has a, a, a soul in, um, uh, in the, in the modern gaming world where no one is really going to learn something. But, uh, in this case, um, the ability, the, the capacity to learn is built into the game itself. And do you think that that interaction, that's what drew you to this project? Because you feel like that's a good way to convey the principles that you're going for, or are you just trying to get the messages and what's important to you across to a new audience, like the gaming audience? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yes to both. Okay. So, so I've, um, I've stepped into places where I hadn't previously been before. Um, we started the radio show star talk, um, where our guests are, are, um, are not scientists generally. They're people hewn from pop culture and I'm the host and I ask them questions that relate to all the way science has touched their lives. So if you come to listen to the show now had having jump species and it appears on television, you come to the show for the celebrity, but you stay for the science. And that was a new medium for me, but I enjoyed it. I have very talented people plugged into it. And so that will, that handles people who didn't know they like science or better yet, people who are sure they didn't like science because they're attracted to that product, if you will, for these other reasons. And like I said, you come for celebrity, you stay for science. The gaming world is just something I, I haven't touched yet. And it's a big part of what people do and how they spend time. And there's surely a place in there where we can find exactly what will serve that audience. And a big part of the Kickstarter program is to absorb um, where not only where people are, but where they want to go, where it has not otherwise been served in the gaming community. You do such a good job of, you know, riling up film lovers with by bringing scientific facts towards things like Star Wars, things like that. If you ever want to rile up the gaming community, there's a series called Mass Effect. If you just sent out one tweet ever about something that was nonsensical in this Mass Effect series, the universe would explode. Uh, people would pay <laughs> so much attention to it. Just to give you a little bait, if you ever want to go for it, Neil. Ooh, this is like, this is low-hanging fruit. This oh is, my this gosh, is... it's right there. There's space blue ladies. There's a bunch of nonsense you could just tear apart if you're interested. Uh, <laughs> no, but again, I don't, you know, I, people think of me as as a as a, a buzzkill type person. <laughs> that's not how I think of myself. I think of myself as someone who is highlighting things you might want to know about what you just witnessed and, yeah. and why and, and, and to enhance your pleasure. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to know while you're playing a game that this thing that wafted by has a whole scientific foundation to it. And it's not just coming off of an artist, um, an artist palette that, um, well, excuse me, it is coming off of an artist palette, but it has foundations in, in, um, uh, in, in real uh, biology, chemistry, physics, engineering. So, so, so that's the goal. Yeah. And like I said, it's a place I've yet to tread, and I, I have no guarantee that it will succeed. Um, but we're, we're sort of two thirds of the way through the Kickstarter. There's another uh, few weeks. It ends at the end of July. Uh, you know, of course, you know how Kickstarters work. You, if you don't raise the money, none of the money gets it changes hands. Right. So, right. Um, so, but in, so, so that's that's the goal. And by the way, when the Kickstarter first kicked about a month ago, it, my face was in every single ad. And and I said, guys, I'm an advisor to this project. And so we we dialed it back just to make it clear that this is an idea that is a collaborative idea. And by the way, um, I have a stable of scientists, science educator scientists that I use for Star for Star Talk, the radio TV show, and they have expertise spread across the scientific spectrum, not only in astrophysics, but neuroscience and, and anthropology. And so we will be bringing their expertise together for this as well. So it'll have a very nice set of uh, a very nice firm scientific foundation. Yeah, for sure. So in the video game world, there's a concept known as feature creep or scope creep. Uh, and when the game that you guys are making is about simulating a galaxy or a universe, how do you know when to stop? What are the limits of this game that you want to make here? Yeah, so uh, what you say is, is not only important in gaming world, but it's important in every, any, any mission creep is one of the great uh, failures 
the fact that that exists represents one of the great failures in ideas that people bring to marketplace or bring to um, uh, in their scope of 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 creativity. So um, uh, I don't mind creeping in the in that sense into a place where there's still good science that can be represented. This will sort of grow the digital universe in which this game lives. Uh, where our intent is to begin with a journey to Proxima B. Proxima is the nearest star to the sun, part of the Alpha Centauri system. We've all heard of Alpha Centauri. It's not a single star. It's a multiple star system. One of them is closest to the sun. Uh, that has a planet, an Earth-like planet orbiting around it. It's like, oh, my gosh, the closest planet to us is Earth-like. So um, the, the idea that we would expand to other exoplanets would not in that context be mission creep. Um, uh, what we could do is, is expand to moons. Moons are fascinating things. They, we used to think they were just dots of rock. And now that in the solar system, that's where the action is. Um, they're moons with ice volcanoes and, and, and buried oceans and, and methane lakes. And so these are real places that have real descriptions. So again, I wouldn't call that mission creep if we make sure that the science stays as a center bit to it. But if we have sort of wizards and dragons. <laughs> it's tough to stop these game designers, Neil. You're going to learn it's along tough. the way. You know what would be fun, though? And I've done this with Superman. I don't know if you know, in Action Comics 14, I helped Superman find Krypton in the actual universe. So there's a, there's a star in the southern hemisphere that has all the right properties in distance and color to be Superman's home star system. And so uh, one thing I want to do is look for all of the fictional places that people have imagined and to see if they could represent actual exoplanets that are out there. That's and then you smart. could visit Superman's planet, Thor's planet. Um, that would just be a fun little side project. Then um, <laughs> that'll further embed it in the, yeah. uh, it's a in project the creative for, uh, universe that so preoccupies uh, the geekosphere. Yeah, something, you know, for that free time that you'll have so much of, Neil. I'd imagine that's a good side project for it. <laughs> But uh, in the gaming world, uh, do you have a favorite video game of all time? Well, no, I'm, you know, I, like I said, I came from old school. You know, I, I'm not in the middle of all that's going. So, like I said, some of this is a learning curve for me, not for others we brought on the project. Um, I, re I remember playing Dark Castle in, in two-bit video, you know, where um, – and, and uh, I remember at the time how important it was that I had a place to escape to in the middle of what is otherwise a busy day or a day where I'm just sort of otherwise exhausted. And so, uh, and there it was just, you know, controlling off the keyboard and, and it was just sort of black and white pixelated journey that you're taking, but it, it was escapist. And I, I and I, I recognize and I value what role that plays when I was in college. Now we're going back to the 1970s. Um, we had guys that programmed, um, early versions of asteroids and what was fun about asteroids. Okay. Again, it's just two bit. And these were, these were CRTs, green CRTs. Um, you could program a, a folded universe in that. So there's a source of gravity in the middle. So everyone is responding to a force of gravity, a correct force of gravity, and you can shoot at people, but your projectile is of course suspect, um, susceptible to not only the force you gave it, but the force of gravity added to it. But what you could also do is shoot off the side of the screen and then it would come off the others because the, 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 the edges of the universe were folded. Of course. You could shoot this way and get someone who wasn't looking on the other side. So, <laughs> so, so again, that was a, a great time waster in college when I should have been studying for my physics exams. Yeah, naturally. Uh, I've meaning to ask you too, uh, if our universe is a simulation, is there any chance it started as a Kickstarter project? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. My, my big disturbing fact about this is that there is no good argument against us being in a simulation. But we're too important it's, to be a uh, simulation, Neil. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, and as our computing power grows and we can put more and more detail into our games and possibly give characters the illusion of free will that they have, that they might have, they might then develop their own computing systems and then develop their own universes within their uh, uh, places of action. And so I, 
and it, but it's the only way I can explain really weird things that happen every few decades. You know, weird politics rises up or, 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 uh, uh, war, you know, global war. These are things that rise and then fall and fade and things are, are, are beautiful and calm for a while. And I'm thinking the programmer says, all right, that's enough guys. We got to stir the pot. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's throw in, let's, let's, uh, here's Donald Trump for you. See how you can deal with that. <laughs> how, can we, are, is, is there an argument against that? I don't think I don't there is. Know. So if people want to help fund the creation of your universe they should go check out the space odyssey project yeah well again i you know i try not to tell people what to do Naturally. um to the extent that they feel that the marketplace could benefit from it and uh we live in a time where science literacy is no doubt more important than ever before if you can gain science literacy while um having fun and doing your normal sort of gaming uh, getting your gaming uh, mojo on um i think that's a good thing for the world and uh but more importantly i think this uh, a, a big part of this kickstarter is to gather um some of the wisdom that's already out there of people's wants people's needs and fold that in in ways that uh could best serve the gaming community absolutely and real quick before you go uh, mr tyson what happens when we die and can you make it so that we don't die <laughs> i've been meaning to ask you this okay here's the thing yes there's a consequence if we don't die uh-huh uh, if, if we never die uh, it, that is, if you can biologically live forever, it means the number one cause of death will be car accidents. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So think about that because it means there'll be no disease. Yes. So, so that means now you have to have self-driving cars. So that's a good thing. So that's fine. Okay. But then you might still be afraid to cross the street or ever get into a bar brawl because that could be the end of your life that could have gone for another thousand years. Interesting. So A, B, if people live forever – then the projections for the population of the earth grow even faster than what they're currently projected to do. Because what they're currently projected is you have birth rates and it is assuming people die. Okay. And the birth rates outstrip the, the, the death rates. So the population grows. But if nobody dies, then there is no death rate. And so we will rapidly need to terraform Mars to accomplish this. Okay. So there we go. What we might do is throw a scenario in the game where the population of the Earth is overrun, and now you have to make Mars livable. Mm. Go, all right. Beautiful. <laughs> so, we'll see. Yeah. If it by works. the way, I worry if you live forever. Yeah. Um, what would motivate you to wake up each morning to try to do something interesting? Uh, and so, I, for me, I'm content knowing my life is limited because it gives measure and value to every waking day of my life. And that's why we love you, Dr. Tyson. So thank you so much oh. and best of luck with your project and all your endeavors in the interactive world. So thank you for your time, sir. Thanks for finding me. I'm in Australia now, but so thanks for finding me down under. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do glad it's best. worked out. All right. Take care, sir. Thank you so much for watching this excerpt from the Game Informer Show podcast. You can subscribe to the audio version and listen to new episodes airing every Thursday. We cover big games on the horizon, games that we've just reviewed. We have long form developer interviews, a lot of fun stuff. So check it out every Thursday.